I, uh, I did play hooky last week, so, you know, m one of my old stomping grounds is Mount Shasta, so I shared a, a few pictures with others, and um, they really enjoyed looking at them, so I thought, well, might as well share a few with you before we get started, so I um, did go back uh, with some folks from work. I just, there's only, I think, one picture or two that has other folks in it, just because I don't want to incriminate them much, <laughs> right? But uh, let's look at a few Shasta pictures. We get kind of ready to dive into the Word of God. That's, um, I think Mike said, you, you look in your element, Dave, there. So um, truly, it's, it's a joy for me to get into nature, into some great landscape like that that can just swallow you up. and. Um, and uh, immerse you in, in a sense of wonder and amazement at what God can do with, with the, his breath, you know, to just make that be there. Um, and um, you spend a lot of breath trying to get up that thing, by the way, which I did not. I did not get to the top, um, which is quite okay these days, you know. If I, if I never stand on that rock again, uh, it's okay. It's, uh, you've got a pretty good view from below as well. Um, so a handful of others. This is uh, Scratchy there with me. Uh, that's just a beanie baby that Brendan gave me. So I take Scratchy when I travel. So um, don't hike alone. Never hike alone. I do not. Um, this is a, a guide house at a place called Horse Camp. And it used to be someone lived there. And, um, and this just shows how it it's, can actually be fully buried in snow. And, um, you can't use this for anything. It's sort of an a, uh, unofficial museum. But you can go in there and look. And if the weather was bad, you could hunker down if, if you needed to. <coughs> This is Julia, someone from work, and then that's me in front of her. So this is the sort of thing we had to trudge through uh, to get to our base camp. And it, it did take quite a bit longer than we anticipated. So it took about eight hours of snowshoeing to get to our camp. And the camp is coming up here, I think. I think I got a little bit out of order. Yeah, this one. So this is where we camped. And, this is the west face of Mount Shasta. We have Mount Shasta, or Shastina Peak on the left there. And you know, you can pick and choose how you want to try to climb over that ridge there. Once you do that, there's more to climb. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a, a magnificent mountain. And then, uh, yeah, this is me, you can tell there. Um, I'm meeting my friend Ken, who's just coming down from the mountain, and so he was uh, he was really motivated to get up there. Last time we went, it was really windy, and we had to turn around. Um, and although uh, lack of sleep and drive and other things told me that it wasn't my day to get up there, it felt like Ken needed a chance, and so um, I went up for a bit, um, and then basically said. You got this, man. And he did. So he, he summited and he was pretty happy. But this also gives you a little bit of perspective about how far things are away. So it's a big space. Um, I had no idea that it was going to be a full moon. So when we were climbing, there was plenty of light, just ambient light. And here the moon is about to set. Um, over the other side there, I guess the Cascade Range, and, and um, um, just a beautiful thing. So really appreciated that. And then it's kind of a last look, you know, before we leave the, the beauty of that place and spend another few hours uh, <coughs> mushing through the snow to get back home. But uh, uh, really a wonderful trip. And, um, 
a, a nice place to spend a weekend, in my opinion. Not everyone's opinion, <laughs> but Arthur's shaking his head. Uh, so, but I um, would like to shift gears by way of introduction into the sermon. Um, you all remember the animated film Finding Nemo. And this movie came out about the time that our daughter was young <clears throat> and we saw every animated film there was. Every one of them. Um, and Nemo, Finding Nemo was a delight, really. So we had a great time. It was especially wonderful for kids, little girls, these colorful clown fishes, and the whole plot about trying to save Nemo, find him and save him. And so we enjoyed this film, and I remember going to work. Oh, yeah, so I don't knock Harold's computer onto the stage. And then he would have a rather exorbitant birthday present from me. So he's like, yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> so um, I told my friend John, who shared a space next to me at work, and I, oh, yeah, we saw Finding Nemo. It, it was great. Uh, we loved it, and he said, yeah, whatever. Um, I said, that, that really, that's just one thing after another, you know? I mean, you have the father fish, and the son gets, you know, captured, and then so he's going, and he has one thing after another, almost gets eaten by sharks, then he's almost stung to death by jellyfish, and then he um, almost gets eaten by some big monster fish from the deep. And then he gets swallowed by a whale. Then he gets spat out by a whale. And then other things happen, one thing after another, interrupting his mission to find his son. But if it wasn't for all those interruptions, there'd be no movie. So he said, basically, big deal. And there's some truth to that. And that is about the loosest connection possible to go into actual factual story about what I call Savior interrupted. Uh, Jesus gets interrupted in the middle of an interruption. And that happens in the book of Matthew. And we will begin, we're reading from the NIV, and Matthew 9. He has just crossed the Galilee in a boat and got out, immediately healed somebody. And then in verse 9, it says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So let's go back to the top a little. We have another section in a few minutes. But this account is written by Matthew, right? So Matthew is writing about himself. And he identifies himself as a tax collector. We all know the kind of attitude people had towards tax collectors back in those days. <clears throat> they were viewed as traitors, kind of as um, scum, I guess. People who are um, corroborating with the enemy. So, um, and we know the details of these things. But they are not highly esteemed by the, your regular Jewish folk because they're in league with the enemy, the Romans. And so this is a person that would be despised and is lumped in with another group that is just identified as sinners. 
tax collectors, and sinners. And so the Pharisees had asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And back to what Jesus said, on hearing this, he said, is, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So, who knows what that quote comes from. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Any guesses? Is it Hosea? Hosea, yes. Well done, Arthur. It's from the book of Hosea, where God has told the prophet Hosea, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Hosea 6, verse 6. And I won't turn there because it will pop up right there. An acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So it's an interesting thing that Jesus, when he answers the Pharisees, he's basically saying, you know the book, <laughs> you know the scroll, go back to the scroll and read it again. Go back to the scroll and read it again because I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. And his other comment um, about sinners, I would like to go to Romans 3 verse 10. And this is Paul, of course, after Jesus has already been crucified and he ascended and um, Paul is referring back to the Old Testament as well. It says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. So I think we should broaden the net a bit when we use the term sinners. Because this would actually include the Pharisees as well, would it not? It would include everyone. And this uh, has, been, uh, has been referenced from the Psalms. There's Psalm 53 and there's Psalm 14. Um, I will go ahead and read the one from Psalm 14. There's two. You don't have it on this screen. Unless Mike is faster than I. And he might be. But let me just read it here. In verse 2 of Psalm 14, it says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have altogether become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So, there's really none righteous. I think it's fascinating and we think about Matthew's account here. Matthew names himself as a tax collector, someone who is despised by most people in his community. Even though by the time he wrote this account, he was no longer a tax collector. He was a follower of Jesus. He was an apostle. He was a witness to the saving message of Jesus Christ but he wrote himself into the account as a tax collector in order to share that testimony of how he was lost and now found. And he didn't mind, <laughs> right? He didn't mind being um, someone who was among sinners, one among, you might think of him as an embezzler, right? A financial, um, some of those words. But someone taking advantage of others um, by his position. <clears throat> I heard it said that um, it's not just our testimony of how we came to Christ that matters, but our testimony of how we remain in Christ. Because once we know, then we follow. And in following, then we live out the gospel as um, the Holy Spirit guides us. Let's read the next section. Um, it skips over 
a few verses and then goes to verse 18 in Matthew 9. Now you'll notice that other accounts of this story are more detailed. Matthew just gives the very basics because um, we know from um, another account that uh, the ruler that came was Jairus. Um, so in verse 18, when he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. And so this is his first interruption. Savior interrupted. Right? He's interrupted from dinner. Dinner wasn't just sitting down to a bunch of Big Macs, right? I mean, um, it, was a, it might take all afternoon, most of the evening. You're in somebody's home. They've spent a lot of time preparing. It's a big deal. Um, it will take hours. And <clears throat> Jesus got up and left. I think it would be very, it wouldn't be unreasonable for him to say, Come sit down with us. Tell us more about what happened. Dine with us, and then we'll all go together. Now, Jesus immediately got up and left this party to minister to Jairus. And in verse 20, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. So Jesus was interrupted from his interruption. Again, he does not mind. He does not send this person away. He does not tell this person to wait because I have something else to do right now. He attends to her need immediately. I was thinking for some reason of, it might be the absolute antithesis of this. There was an iconic uh, actor and comedian in American culture who went by the name W.C. Fields. Some of you will remember. And what is one of his most famous catchphrases? I heard somebody say, I think Nancy, go away, kid, you bother me, right? One of the most irreverent personalities ever. The absolute opposite of the attitude of Jesus. If anybody was important, it was Jesus. If anybody was busy, it was Jesus. But he doesn't say, go away, you're bothering me. He stops and pays attention and looks at the person and treats them as a human. I read in one commentary that this woman took great risk to approach him because she was unclean. She could have been exiled for going out in public and for touching a rabbi, no less. And how did he respond? With mercy and compassion, like he told the Pharisees, go and learn this. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And mercy is what he offered and gave to the woman. And so in verse 23, when Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand. By the way, I, a dead person was also unclean. <clears throat> he took the girl by the hand and she got up and news of this spread through all that region. 
sometimes, I think maybe on the first few readings of this account, whether it might have been years ago, when Jesus says, go and learn this, I think I inserted a bit of sarcasm into, into the um, scene. But when I think about it now, I think there was none at all. Jesus simply said the things that he meant, right? Jesus wanted the Pharisees to learn about mercy. You know, one of the silliest things I've ever thought, and I've thought many, there are people who can attest to this, I thought about how you can make things out of things, right? You can make things out of themselves. If you took sugar, you could make gummy bears out of it. You could make all kinds of candy. You could make frosting. You could make cakes. You could make sugar out of sugar, right? If you could arrange it, you could make a model of the molecule sugar out of sugar. And that's pretty ridiculous, I think, right? To make sugar out of sugar. But that would be the ultimate, right? It is what it is. But if we apply that ridiculous idea to the Bible, right? Of course, it's natural. Um, the law is made out of love, right? And God is love. All parts of the Godhead is love. And law is instruction manifested out of love. It is love in action. God didn't send the law to us as a burden, but as an instruction how to give and receive and understand love. And because he knew we wouldn't, he came in person to show how to live it out so that we have an intellectual aspect to it. And then we have a embodied, incarnate version of love and law and how they are inseparable. And this is how Jesus, in saving the world, doesn't mind being interrupted by ministering to people. Because it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. For the Pharisees who know the law, he teaches them that the law is made out of love, something they missed. For tax collectors and sinners who don't know about the law, who don't know about righteousness, through mercy, through stepping into their lives, through healing their illnesses, he teaches them through love about law. And in this way, our Savior, who was interrupted from dinner, is actually not interrupted. It's why he came. He came to be troubled. He came to be, um, he came to be brought into our lives. He came to invite us into his kingdom. So um, this little section of scripture, I think, is, is something that we can meditate on. And I know so many who say that the more we read something, the more we understand about it, the more the Holy Spirit shows us. And even something in such a short passage, how Jesus has something for everyone. Jairus the Pharisee, Matthew the tax collector, the folks that are um, outcasts from normal society because they've fallen into ways of, of sin that they can't escape. But Jesus shows a way out, and Jesus doesn't mind associating with them. <clears throat> Jesus comes in close to all, for because for, none of us deserve him. As the psalmist wrote, there is none righteous, not one. Not until 
we take on the righteousness that Jesus gives us freely. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord, and thank you. So let us remember how Jesus interrupts the timeline of the universe to bring us into it. And let us accept that and accept his presence and his salvation with joy and gratitude. Let's pray. Father, thank you for stepping out of eternity into the world that we know and in this existence that is bound by space and time and you who have given us a glimpse of something that is beyond space and time but also beyond beyond the existence that we know in terms of our give and take and our relationships. You've shown us that love love goes forever. Love, love is also beyond space and time. And thank you for opening our, our ears and our hearts and help us as the week goes from here that as we are interrupted from our business that we remember you being interrupted for us and that we with a gentle spirit and an attitude of helpfulness and compassion and offer ourselves for those who might get a glimpse of you through that experience. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say our benediction. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen. Amen.